Hello and welcome. I'm Brent Donaldson with Modern Machine Shop and welcome to this ETC Talks presentation that we're calling The Race to Unleash American Machine Tool Performance. So there's a lot to unpack in that title and it all begins with the collaborative agreement being overseen by the US Department of Energy that involves a deceptively simple test. Uh, this test could radically increase throughput of the United States existing base of CNC machine tools. So joining me now is Scott Smith, Group Leader Intelligent Machine Tools at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Jamie Gettler, Director of Metalworking Innovation at MSC Industrial Supply Company, and Andrew Honeycutt, R&D staff member at Oak Ridge National Lab. So welcome to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Brian. So let's set the stage for this presentation a bit. Um, back in 2017, the president issued an executive order, Executive Order 13806, which set in motion a, quote, whole of government effort to assess risks and propose recommendations in support of a healthy manufacturing and industrial base. So for the next year after this order was issued, the DOD, the Department of Defense, uh, responded by creating an interagency task force that compiled data and information from defense contractors, academics, engineers, industry experts, and company executives. So after all of this information gathering process was complete, the task force walked away with one overriding judgment. And that was that the US manufacturing and defense industrial base was plagued by critical weaknesses. So the resulting DOD report notes that while the US it, uh, once led the world in the innovation and capacity of high-end machine tools, our leadership in this regard began to steadily decline beginning around the year 2000. So let's start by talking about this assessment and why its findings represent a national security threat to the United States and not just in terms of conventional warfare. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with that one, Brent. The, certainly the DOD has been worried about this for some time. Um, we all know that machine tools are the machines that make other machines. And when you don't have sufficient capacity to produce your own machine tools, then the supply chains start to get long and you start to be dependent on other countries for the things that you need. And what's true for the DOD is broadly true. Uh, we've seen it most recently in our response to uh, COVID and the difficulty in ramping up the production of personal protective equipment, masks and fibers and test tubes uh, clearly illustrates the problem of not having a sufficient machine tool base. So one of the things that's really exciting about this project is that we're helping the existing installed US machine tool users use their equipment more effectively. And also the new equipment that they're acquiring, we're helping them be more competitive with that right away. So the DOD's report concluded by urging the president to sign a new executive order, this one directing the DOD and other federal agencies to implement more than a dozen proposals, including an effort to, quote, diversify away from complete dependency on sources of supply in politically unstable countries who may cut off U.S. access, end quote. So, of course, this is a monumental challenge, right? Even if company leaders decide to relocate production lines back to the U.S. tomorrow, the report acknowledges that we would lack the, the skilled workforce needed to operate them. Um, but there was one promising response to the DOD's assessment that is already underway, um, and that is a collaborative agreement uh, being overseen by the U.S. Department of Energy that uh, involves this test. So before we get to the test itself, please ex somebody explain the collaborative agreement and its goals. Absolutely, hey Brent, Jamie. Um, our CRADA, our Cooperative Research and Development Agreement uh, that MSC has with Oak Ridge and the DOE, uh, as Scott outlined, it, it essentially is to improve milling operations for American businesses in both new and existing equipment. So you think about milling, it's about 40% of all cutting tool operations across the country. And so the opportunity to, to really improve the competitiveness, the capacity gains uh, potentially can have a really strong impact on uh, these businesses, as well as frankly, having an impact in a positive manner to offset some of the perils of the skills gap. So when we talk about the CRADA, you know, that's what we're setting out to do and how do we do it? essentially is is that we're you know using this what we refer to as msc millmax and in a moment scott's going to outline machining dynamics and this is 
the system that we're utilizing to improve milling in that manner. We use 100, over 100 metalworking specialists or metalworking professionals nationwide will be outfitted with the technology in order to find these kinds of improvements for these business, businesses and really appeal to the CRADA. Now, the details of the CRADA, you know, there's some milestones and some expectations of things that we'll accomplish. You know, one of them was is that we create a really robust training curriculum and nobody better than Scott and Tony Schmitz, Tom Delio, Dave Barton to help us do that. Uh, the scale of our metalworking specialist team allows us to get essentially to, to most any customer in America to impart this technology on them. We are engaging machine tool dealers now with the process. So for new equipment, we're able to help them improve and customers improve and optimize right off the bat. And then finally, this robust, this robust database of testing that we'll have over time will allow us all to become more intelligent so we can optimize sooner and quicker than ever before in the future. It's been extremely rewarding, uh, no doubt about it, Brent. But uh, you know, we're fortunate to be part of it. And uh, you know, that's the details of our crate. So the underlying technology behind this agreement is a topic that I wrote about uh, for the October issue of Modern Machine Shop. Um, and really this publication has covered this technology for more than 20 years. At the, at, at the core um, of this technology is the ability to measure frequency dynamics in a machine tool and use those measurements to radically increase throughput in the existing base of CNC machine tools. So before we dive deeper into this tech, can someone give a brief description of what is alternately described as a tap test, impact test, or machining dynamics test? Yeah, Brent, I'd love to answer that question. Um, so uh, in order to understand the frequency dynamics or the structural dynamics of a machine tool or a cutting tool, you have to put everything together. You need the tool, you need the tool holder, you need the machine tool spindle. So. The only way to um, know what the tool point dynamics will be is to assemble everything, to put it all together and, to, and then to measure it. So this technology is, um, it's, it, it is called a tap test or an impact test because you actually impact the cutting tool with a hammer. Now this isn't just any hammer, this is a specialized instrumented hammer that can measure the force uh, with very high levels of precision. Uh, to complement the hammer is an accelerometer that you attach or affix to the tool. And when once you impact the hammer, the force and the time uh, signature of that impulse is known. So you know how much energy you put into the system. The accelerometer measures the response of that tool. So what does the tool do after it's been impacted? And knowing those two pieces of information allow us to understand the structural dynamics of that assembly so that we can use that information to intelligently select machining parameters uh, for the milling operations. So this presentation is going to walk us through the technology behind these tests, which again have been evolving for a couple of decades now. Before we dive in, why should we care about this technology? What are the broad findings related to improvements in machine utilization? Yeah, Brent, I'm gonna take that one. So we've been deploying in a pilot manner for about 18 months. And then uh, we recently released, and Scott's gonna show you in a moment, uh, how we're deploying the kits across America. But we have a tremendous amount of early results. We recognize, again, that American businesses wanna be more competitive, they wanna be more profitable. They want to grow their capacity and not always have to buy new equipment to do that and overcome the skills gap. So some of the early results that we've seen, an average of 170% of material removal rate is typically the be all end all metric within milling is, is just that. And that's more than doubling what we're finding when we show up with the customer. It's just a tremendous result associated with that if you can remove material that much more quickly and do it in a responsible and stable manner, you're also improving tool life. There's another benefit. And you're also improving cycle times. So our cycle time average improvement right now after that amount of time is 40%. So you think about that. If something took you 10 minutes to do an operation that was milling before and now it's six, the, the, the consequence of that and the compounding effect of what that can do for any manufacturing facility is pretty amazing. So 
early results, that's what we're seeing. And I think that's why everybody should really care about it. All right. Uh, so let's dive into this to our live audience. This is a reminder that if you have any questions, you can type them in at any time on the panel on your the right hand side of your screen and we'll do our best to get to them at the end. Um, without further ado, let's begin the presentation. When it's done, we'll meet back here and talk a little bit more. Scott, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Smith. I'm the group leader for intelligent machine tools at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, today, I'm going to be describing a cooperative research and development agreement project between Oak Ridge National Laboratory and MSC, and it has to do with measuring cutting performance of machine tools. Um, this project uh, is featured in the October 2020 issue of uh, Modern Machine Shop magazine. Um, it's the cover article. Um, it leverages funding from the Department of Defense in particular, the Industrial Base Assessment and Sustainment Program. Um, the funding for Oak Ridge National Laboratory, of course, derives from the Department of Energy, and in particular, the Advanced Manufacturing Office. And of course, MSC is our industrial partner. So what's the objective? Currently, when we write an NC program for a machine tool, um, the, the, the tool, it, is only considered by its geometry, right? The, in a milling operation, the tool is a cylinder, the workpiece is a prism, and as long as the cylinder moves past the prism in all the right places, then the finished part is created. At least that's the way that it works in the digital world. In the physical world, we have to worry about other constraints, and there's a lot of them. Um, so, for example, it's obvious that I can't program a cut that consumes more power than the machine has available, right? I, I can't uh, choose a cut that will demand more torque than the spindle can deliver. Uh, tool wear is an issue, surface finish is an issue, and so on. One of the uh, significant challenges for most people who are creating NC programs is dealing with the stiffness. And if you choose wrong conditions for the stiffness that you have, then bad things happen. Uh, for example, like chatter um, between the tool and the workpiece that leaves a bad surface finish. Now there's a lot of different possible combinations of hardware that contribute to the stiffness that matters. So there's the machine, there's the spindle, there's the tool, the tool holder, there's the stick out of the tool. And it turns out that all of those things matter. Um, when the NC programmer starts to create a part, like on the top right, uh, the programmer has to make a lot of choices. Now, you get guidance on some of these. Um, chip load, for example, has to do with the strength of the cutting edge, and those values are tabulated. You can find recommendations for that. Spindle speed, um, sometimes you get guidance, but often in a range, and more often that has to do with tool wear. But axial depth of cut, radial depth of cut, you're pretty much on your own for making those selections. In fact, the NC programming software lets you make these choices without even knowing anything about the machine. Uh, in fact, you can write the part program and then post-process it for one machine or post-process it for a different machine. And if geometry was the only thing that mattered, that would be okay. But of course, those machines are different and they have different performance capabilities. Um, if you choose wrong, then you wind up creating surfaces like on the bottom right, right? That's, a, that's, that's the chatter uh, that was created during the milling process. So how do you choose the right conditions? Um, realistically, in most machine shops, you just don't know. Um, it, there is a measurement, which I'll tell you about shortly, but if you're not measuring, you're guessing. And if you're guessing and your guess is wrong, then it's bad. And so what happens is often that you scrap the workpiece and you have to try again, or you break the tool and you have to try again. And all of those things are bad for the machine as well. So let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, here you see a figure that has six different uh, tools in it. And these are all half inch uh, diameter, uh, four flute end mills. And if I look at the catalog recommendation, what I should choose, you can see down here in the red boxes, it gives me a surface speed range 
somewhere between 800 and 2,000 surface feet per minute. That's a pretty big range. And it also recommends a chip load for me of 6 thou per tooth. But all of those tools would get exactly the same recommendation from the catalog. And it's clear that those tools are different. Some of them have a short stick out. Some of them have a long stick out. They're, some of them are stiffer than other ones. So they're different, and they're going to behave differently. So let me show you what typically happens. Um, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, every tool in every holder in every machine has a picture like the picture at the bottom. So this is a picture that was made for a slotting cut with a milling tool. And on the vertical axis is the axial depth of cut, and on the horizontal axis is the spindle speed. I'm not telling you how this picture is made at the moment, but what I will tell you is that everything that's red is bad, chatter. Everything that's white is good. So let's presume we don't know about this picture at the moment, but I'm going to use it to help explain what typically happens. So I've got my tool in my machine. I'm going to cut a piece of aluminum. I have a 16,000 RPM spindle. I want to make the best use of my machine possible. One very common thing for people to do is to go right to the top speed of the spindle. Um, and okay, it's a quarter inch, uh, uh, I'm sorry, half inch uh, diameter tool. And so I'm going to make a cut that's maybe a quarter of that deep, right? Three millimeters deep. And um, that's the cut that's marked with a red dot under the number one. And clearly that's in a bad spot. And so this chatter. And so the company that's, that's making this cut says, okay, we were too aggressive. We got to reduce the depth of cut. And they reduce the depth of cut and reduce the depth of cut and finally get to the green dot that's below the number one. And they say, okay, that's, that's the cutting conditions for this part. But that's pretty terrible, right? The axial depth of cut that's there is on the order of a quarter of an inch. Okay, they might say, you know, maybe we were being too aggressive. We shouldn't run the spindle flat out at its top speed. Let's go to three quarters of its top speed. That's the cut that's marked number two. And you can see at three millimeters, it's still pretty bad. Um, and you reduce the depth of cut, you reduce the depth of cut, finally you get it stable. But again, a, about a half a millimeter, a quarter of a millimeter, somewhere in there, it's a tiny little cut uh, that stays stable. Well, maybe I have another choice. I could go to the middle of the surface speed range that was recommended for this tool in that material. It turns out that's the cut that's marked number three. Um, uh, that's um, yeah, the cut that's marked number three. Again, three millimeters deep, and and that's a problem. So I reduce the depth of cut. I reduce the depth of cut. Finally, around a quarter of a millimeter or so, it becomes stable. If that's all the information that I have, I'm going to say this is a terrible tool. I hate this tool. This job is going to take a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. But if, in fact, it was possible for me to know this picture, I could go to cut number four. So cut number four has a lot bigger axial depth of cut. Three millimeters is fine. Um, and the metal removal rate there is a lot higher uh, than it would have been in the stable cuts in any of the other arrangements. So there is a measurement that I can make that will produce this picture. What's that measurement like? Well, it's not too complicated. Um, but it turns out that we hit the tool with a hammer. Now, it's not just any hammer. It's an instrumented hammer. It measures the force of the hip, and there's an accelerometer, a vibration measuring device. That's what's at the end of the little blue wire. And so we have to hit the tool, and we measure how the tool vibrates, and that information is enough to create this picture that's there in the bottom right. Okay, so we call this thing a, a tap test. And you can see that we measured in two directions, X and Y, in the plane of the cut, we didn't measure in the direction along the axis of the tool because that's typically significantly stiffer. I have a couple of videos here um, that shows what happens if I choose wrong and what happens if I choose right. Um, I'll tell you that the metal removal rate in the right-hand picture is about three times higher than the metal removal rate in the left-hand uh, picture. It's a video. So let me show you this. This is the first one, and it's unstable. 
Okay, so you're familiar with the sound, right? That's the sound of an unstable cut. Now I'm gonna show you a cut that has a significantly higher metal removal rate and it's stable. Okay, quite a difference. Um, more about the little speedometer here in just a moment. Um, I'll show you the surfaces. That's the chattered surface on the left and the stable surface on the right. Um, so it's not just that it makes an unpleasant sound, it also makes uh, bad surfaces. Now it turns out that this measurement that we make is not specific to the tool, it's specific to the assembly, right? That's really the challenge. It's the tool, the tool holder, the spindle, the machine tool, that's the whole assembly that counts. Um, the same tool will look different in different machines. Here's three different machines that are relatively similar in their size, same tool in each of those machines, um, but you can see that uh, those are different pictures. There's different performance um, from each one of those. In this case, the gray part is where the chatter is and the white part is the stable zone. Interestingly, the red part in those top three figures um, shows the available power uh, from that spindle. Okay, so how do we get this information to the people who need it, right? Is the test expensive? Is it hard to do? Um, how are we gonna show this to people who write the programs? The, that's who needs the information. NC programmers need machine and tool specific information at the time that they write the NC program and in a form that they can use. It turns out the measurement is easy to make, um, anyone can learn how to do it. The equipment is not too expensive, but it does take time and practice to learn how to make good measurements. And this is beyond the capability of most shops. The focus of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory MSC Cooperative Research and Development Agreement is on deploying the technology through MSC metalworking specialists. So the goal is to improve the performance of the existing installed machine tool base, and of course, to improve the performance of newly acquired machines. So the first step is to try to make this picture a little bit easier to understand. So I said the, on the top picture, the, the top graphic, the vertical axis was the axial depth of cut and the horizontal axis was spindle speed and everything that's red is bad and everything that's white is okay. And um, you might notice this one has a little band around the red part. And you might think about that like a warning track. Um, I really don't want to get too close to that edge because um, little changes in the setup might cause um, me to slip from a stable zone into an unstable zone. But what we did is to map these stable and unstable zones onto a speedometer, right? So on the speedometer that you see on the bottom left, right, that's spindle speed around the dial, and the needle points to the speed that you selected. Green is good, red is bad, and yellow is just on the margin in between uh, good and bad. So I want to I want to put the needle in the middle of one of those big fat green zones. On the right, you see a graphic that represents the cutting tool, and what you can see there, there's a couple of sliders, and I can drag those sliders around. You know, I said that the graphic on the top was for a slot, um, but of course, there's lots of other kinds of cuts you can make with a milling tool, and so when you drag those sliders around, the speedometer will update itself. Now I'm going to show you. A uh, um, one of these uh, dashboards. Um, it's it's on a website, and so I can. Uh, you can see right now that that needle is pointing into the middle of one of the unstable zones, and the graphic down here tells me that that one is going to chatter. Um, but if I were to reduce the depth of cut, um, you know, I can see that uh, uh, more stable zones appear. Right, so this is updating itself. And then I can drag the needle around and put it right in the middle of one of those big fat zones, right, green zones. So my objective with this selection is not to get as close to the edge as I can. My objective is to choose a robust solution, okay? But in fact, it, it's better if I can more repeatably set up the tool. And I mean that the stick out length matters. 
The number of flutes on the tool matters. The torque on the retention knob matters. If I'm using a collet, the torque on the collet nut matters. I should be setting all of those things uh, with a torque wrench, uh, for example. Okay, let me go back to the presentation now. Um, so the dashboards, we, we call this thing on the right a dashboard, and it's specific to at least the machine model, the spindle, the tool holder, the tool, the number of flutes, and the stick out. Right? So I need to be able to repeatedly uh, set those things up in order to make maximum use of a dashboard. Okay, so this this slide is showing the training of the MSC metalworking specialist at the manufacturing demonstration facility at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, so, so far, the project just started in 2020. Um, there have been 20 metalworking specialists who learned how to use the technology at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So they came on site on our facilities and we spent a couple of days going through the training. Um, there's a, a nice photograph of all the group who took the training um, and they're standing next to our um, 3D printed uh, Shelby Cobra. Some of you might be familiar with that one. Um, but shortly after this uh, training started, um, COVID-19 caused us to shift uh, to an online uh, training mode. Um, so far, 28 more metalworking specialists have learned how to make these measurements, um, and they are deploying it in the field currently. Um, so how's it going? I'm, I'm going to say great. Um, on average, the, the improvement in machine utilization is more than a factor of two. Um, you know, very often we, we fight for little improvements in productivity. But on average, the improvement in machine utilization has been more than a factor of two. Um, right now, uh, where are those metalworking specialists? So as of today, um, in, in October, um, each of these uh, little pins that's on the map indicates a place where an MSC metalworking specialist has been trained um, to make this measurement. But the training program is still aggressively going forward. Um, by the start of December, this is where all the trained metalworking specialists will be. Um, and I'll, I'll show you feedback, some of the things that have resulted from the recent testing. Um, so it's, it, it works in, in, in all kinds of different materials. You can see on the top left here, uh, there's a titanium uh, workpiece. And in this case, the material, material removal rate improved from 4.4 cubic inches a minute to 10.4 cubic inches a minute. And really, it doesn't take much time. Right, this is not a trial and error process. Um, the measurement takes maybe five or 10 minutes uh, per tool. So it's really fast. Um, bottom left shows a uh, 6061 aluminum workpiece. Um, you can see that before the tools were measured, the process was taking 935 seconds, and now it's 805 seconds. So one way to look at this is improving utilization of the machine uh, increases capacity. And so this particular company got an additional 430 capacity hours because they made this measurement. Um, top right is a stainless steel part. Um, and you can see that not having problems with chatter also leads to longer tool life. And in this case, it went from 25 parts per tool uh, to 237 parts per tool. So there's a savings on the, on the tools. Um, I'll also point out that chatter is bad for the machine tool, um, and it changes the taper, it wears out the spindle, and so there's reduced maintenance that goes with this also. Um, bottom right is a part that is compacted graphite iron, and in this case, the uh, material removal rate uh, was improved by 64%. Okay, so where's the project going? Right now, um, the measurement is easy. Um, the deployment is going well. Uh, there's good success with the people who have had the measurements made. But you need a dashboard for every tool in every machine, right? Every tool, every holder, every machine. And that's a lot of measurements. Um, maybe um, one of the things Oak Ridge is particularly interested in is that we should be able to accumulate data over time. 
And that means that there's a lot of tests, but let's not forget any of them. And over time, machine learning and AI should allow us to make reasonable recommendations for tool, tool holder uh, spindle assemblies that haven't been measured yet. But they wind up being close to something that we already measured. I'm also going to point out that quality dashboards lead to better quotations. Um, particularly in small shops, this is a real challenge. If you're only going to make a few parts, you know, you make a quotation based on what you expect the tools to be able to do. And then when you find out, you know, in the example that I showed you earlier, you thought you were going to be able to make a cut that was three millimeters deep, but it turns out you can only make a cut that's a quarter of a millimeter deep. Um, it winds up taking a lot longer to make the part than you imagined, a lot more time on the machine than you imagined, that's bad. But it's also bad for the customer, right? How does the customer believe that, you know, you, you say that you'll have the part in a week, um, how do they believe that you will deliver it in that time frame? Quality dashboards lead to better estimates of machining time and cost. I'm also going to point out that dashboards indicate when maintenance is needed. So a lot of people have the experience that one day the machine behaves a certain way, another day the machine behaves a different way. Um, that's not how it should be. If you measure and create a dashboard, that dashboard will work. And if it doesn't work, something's wrong. It might be that there was a change in your setup, which you should fix. It might be, okay, for example, um, you saw that spindle speed really matters. So you can't adjust the spindle speed override knob as an example. Um, but it also might be that there's a problem like the drawbar force uh, has been lost, something like that. So all of those things are maintenance issues uh, that can be indicated by a dashboard that was working, uh, suddenly not working. Okay, so I'll stop there. I'll say thanks for joining, and we'll open the floor up for some questions and answers. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Uh, to our live audience, this is a reminder that now is your opportunity to ask questions. Just type them into the panel on the right, and we'll do our best to get to them. Uh, we already have a few questions in the queue. Let me start with this. Um, does chip load factor into this equation? Yeah, so uh, I'll take that one. Um, so we, we are still constrained by the ordinary limits of chip load. That's related to the strength of the cutting edge. So if, if, you, if the chip load is too high, you can, you can chip and insert, break a tool, and that limit is still there. And if your chip load is too low, then you, you might be burnishing uh, rather than cutting, uh, for example. That limit is still there. But it doesn't change the location of the stable and unstable zones. So within the recommendations that come from the tool manufacturer, the chip load really doesn't change the picture. It does change the level of vibration that you get. So if you're unstable, it's worse if the uh, chip load is high and it's not as bad if the chip load is low. Gotcha. Um, next question, will this work, and you kind of answered this already, will this work on other machining processing, uh, turret lathe, gun drilling, hydromats, et cetera? Yeah, so near, nearly every cutting operation, every material removal operation that exists does have stable and unstable conditions. We see it in turning and grinding and boring and milling and, and all, all kinds of material removal operations. The real sweet spot for the technology at the moment is in milling. And so that's where we're starting. Um, in, in, in turning, it also happens. Um, but generally, the speed where those uh, stable gaps appear is really too high for a turning operation in most cases. Um, we, we see it in drilling. It's a little different. So our, our, first, uh, our first rollout of the technology is in the real sweet spot, which is milling. Next question, is there a size range for tap testing? I'll take that one, guys. Uh, so what we see, Brent, is the valid size range is from 3 eighths of an inch up to about 6 inches. And that includes both solid and indexable tooling, uh, milling tools. Um, from time to time, a quarter inch that may be a two or three flute that you can attach that accelerometer to 
every once in a while you can get a, a get away with tapping a quarter inch, but we we typically look at the three eighths, the six inch, and we we see that that's about eighty or eighty five percent of the marketplace. So, um, Scott, you addressed this to some extent in the presentation, but um, talk a little bit about the history of this. How long has tap testing been around? It's it's got a pretty interesting backstory. Um, it does. So the idea that there were stable and unstable zones, a stability lobe diagram, uh, th this was known in the 1960s, okay? Um, but at the time, uh, many of those stable zone speeds were out of range for the tool materials and the machining equipment that was available at the time. And making the measurement was pretty complicated. Um, the equipment that was required uh, when I was a graduate student, it's not been that long ago. Uh, the equipment to make this measurement cost over $100,000. And you had to be really specially trained in order to make the measurement. Um, over time, the cost of the sensors has gone down. The cost of the data acquisition has gone down. The capability of the machine tools has gotten better. The tool materials got better. And now we are in a place where the location of those stable zones really impacts the productivity of the machine tools. If, if, as you saw in the example uh, in my presentation, you know, if you're guessing, uh, if you have never made this measurement, it is almost guaranteed that you are underusing your equipment. Even if you've done a lot of testing, if you've tried really hard, it's almost guaranteed. Um, as Jamie said, you know, we're seeing typical improvements on the order of a factor of two. So are there any material limitations with tap testing? For instance, uh, is it better for 6061 aluminum versus 316 stainless? Uh, I'll take that one. Um, no, no, it works for all materials. So um, because you can typically mill aluminum at very high spindle speeds, uh, it's you may be it's maybe better for aluminum because you can take advantage of, you know, 14,000, 18,000 RPM spindle speeds, but it works for all materials. The, the diagram is a little different. It, it is material dependent as well. So those dashboards that you see, uh, the material property does matter. Um, but there are great success stories, not only aluminum, but in steels and compacted graphite iron and Inconel and titanium and, and, and polymers even. So yeah, it works in all those places. Brent, that reminds me of a, of a question that we get all the time um, mm -hmm. with, from customers and, and, and from the supplier community is the, um, the materials. The, the fact of the matter is when, when folks in, in the machines, I should say, when, when customers are buying machines that have these higher level RPMs than they've ever had before, mm -hmm. the ability to tap test and have some reasonable sense that this is going to be accurate rather than trial and error on a hundreds of thousands of dollars of machine or millions of dollars of machine tool to have some some sense of security that this this science rather than guesswork is going to show me the way really can prove to be a benefit and that doesn't necessarily mean that it have to be aluminum in high speeds it could be titanium in moderate speeds but uh, it works in all materials and really great for whether it's a production oriented facility or more of a job shop. You know, Jamie, that, that kind of segues into uh, my next question. And that, that is whether tap testing works equally well on new machines and or existing equipment. Yeah. Um, in, in our experience and what we know to be the case is as long as there's a spindle that's, that's spinning tools and there's a milling cutter in it, that there is an opportunity to find stable areas or to optimize it. So if it's a machine tool, we've, we've tapped spindles of 50 year old machines at this point. We've tapped spindles on manual machines and we've tapped spindles in tool assemblies as Scott's outlined on brand new state of the art equipment and tap testing uh, absolutely is a benefit to all of those. So if you are uh, listening to this or if you read the Modern Machine Shop article and you're interested in tap testing, having MSC do these tests, how do you begin the process? So for our customers and those interested in it, and certainly reaching out to your local MSC office uh, is a great place to start. Another great place that you can start is we just uh, 
we just instituted a landing page for uh, Milmax. It's mscdirect.com forward slash solutions forward slash Milmax. And on there, you'll, you'll find a video, a two and a half minute video that explains the process. You'll find some case studies, you'll find some testimonials uh, and other kinds of information, but you'll also have an ability to fill out a, a really brief form that we would take and we would supply to the local area and have them contact you to understand what potentially what need, uh, what operation, uh, we'll make a recommendation for what we feel would be a better uh, state and then come in and, and administer the tap test to do a demonstration for the customer. Excellent. Um, we have another question here. How effective is this in reducing chatter in 90 degree corners? Hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I presume that you're talking about like in a pocketing operation, uh, when you come into a 90 degree corner, it's, it's really common that you'll get chatter right in that spot, right in the corner, you'll get a little chirp. And the reason for that is that in the corner, momentarily, the radial depth of cut increases. If you're, if you're using a, a half of the diameter uh, radial depth of cut going into the corner and half of the diameter radial depth of cut coming out, then right in the corner for a moment, you're making a slot. And so in, in that situation, uh, you should adjust the dashboard so that the uh, radial depth of cut is for a slot. And if you choose a speed that's stable there, you won't have chatter in, in those 90 degree corners. Okay, so I wanna, uh, we're out of questions. I, I wanna um, pass along just sort of um, an anecdote that, that comes from the story that I wrote for uh, Modern Machine Shop about this. And, and it's, it's about a guy named Sean Shepard. Um, Sean is a machinist with 35 years experience who works for Precision, uh, Precision Shapes Inc. in Titusville, Florida. Um, this company is devoted to uh, aerospace part machining, pretty much exclusively using uh, TI-6 titanium. And that's a process that burns through thousands of dollars worth of tooling per month. So um, uh, Precision Shapes was one of the first companies to have MSC come out and conduct a tap test. Um, the data revealed that Shepard had ample room to increase the spindle speed. So Shepard says that adjusting the spindle speed to the higher RPM identified on the software dashboard gained the company 20 additional inches per minute on feed rates and eliminated two hours of cycle time for every 16 parts. And, and I just want to read this quote because I love it. So this is uh, Sean. Uh, Shepard saying, quote, sometimes when we program parts offline, we tend to be babies. We try to baby our tools. We don't want the programmer or the engineer to break it. So sometimes we stick with the speed that works because we don't know any better. Um, but for some, let me get back here. Oh, I just lost the quote. <laughs> here it is. But for some of our longer running jobs, 20 minutes for a single part number can mean thousands of thousands of hours saved by the end of the month. So uh, I just wanted to share that one person's experience using this and the difference that it made um, was substantial. Um, so congratulations to all of you on, on your work. Um, I don't know if you want to you know, address Sean's comment or not, but, but I just think that's remarkable. I, you know, I'll jump in because uh, you know, being out there in the field and, and working with uh, standing this up with, with the company and you know, the virtual training and Scott as a, a professor and Andrew with his background creating a great training curriculum has put us in a position to have those kind of improvements. And we're seeing them almost every day. I, every time I talk to Scott, which we talk almost every day, I say, all right, you guess, guess what? I'm going to tell you another one of these stories about an amazing improvement that we just experienced. And we had one yesterday where in, in Inconel, we improved uh, a customer from 0.6, uh, or I'm sorry, 0.12 to 0.6 material removal rate in literally 12 minutes it took. After years and years of different testing and so on, we were able to accomplish something like that uh, really quickly. So those kinds of improvements are out there, they're everywhere. Is nobody's doing anything wrong? Uh, Brent, it's, it's the science behind it. And uh, you know, we're thrilled to have it and excited to, to deploy it and look forward to having those kind of improvements with customers everywhere. I, I think it's really exciting. Um, you know, the companies that are making parts have really been limited by a lack of information. You know, it, it's amazing that it works as well as it does. 
it, I mean the, the, the current system. It's a tribute to the shops that are out there and, and the attention that they pay, but they don't have enough information. And I think now finally getting them the right information is unleashing huge improvements in productivity for U.S. manufacturers, and we think it's terrific. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, I want to thank Scott, Jamie, and Andrew, as well as Oak Ridge National Laboratory and MSC Industrial Supply Company for making this ETC talk possible. Thanks to everyone listening in. And that does it for today's presentation. On behalf of Modern Machine Shop, I'm Brent Donaldson. Thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.